okay so if you have seen the speaker video i think i have said like no ppts uh, so apparently they needed some ppt to show it as part of the video so just like put together some ppt and most of it is going to be just like linked to code or some code samples or some code snippets in in, in there okay so uh, i'm sudar i work as a research engineer in yahoo labs okay so i've been dealing with web applications throughout my career and currently uh, doing something on node js uh, as part of my day job as well okay so that's it and this is what the agenda is going to be i'll just like be quickly running through the slides and then we'll get to the code and we'll see how we can use different modules in node js and things like that okay so uh, i kind of assume that most of most of you would be uh, slightly new to node js uh, but i think now i mean since most of you have already used to it uh, i think i can just like pass pass in or quickly like go through all these slides so as you know it's what is it's it's basically it's going to be an evented non blocking io built on v8 the usual stuff and it's a javascript programming environment support c++ add-ons and all that so uh so was node js the first evented system available no right so there were a couple of other things which were available as a evented uh, system even before node js some of them is like the twister framework from python or the evented event machine from ruby and all that stuff so okay. so the main difference between all these other frameworks and node js is that node js provides this event io as a language construct rather than as a library or as a framework right so all these other things provided more as a framework and you you may you might have to probably use it as a library but it's not available as part of the language construct itself and that's where node js is different from uh, other evented io uh, things which are present by the way i assume that all of you know about evented io so anybody here have need to need me to explain about evented io so i kind of assume that all of you know about it okay so again node js is not ruby on rails or it's not danjo or it's not code igniter it's it's a framework which provides you where you can write your own ruby on rails or your own danjo or your own code igniter for that instance and the community is doing that and in node js you have you have lot of uh, these frameworks available the the famous among them is like express and socket io connect and all that stuff um okay so this is just Uh, a small slide which i put in to explain what is evented io i'm just going to quickly run through it assuming that all of you know know about evented io so so the basic things right i mean if in any traditional programming language whatever statements you have that gets executed it sequentially so if a particular statement is going to get blocked for some reason maybe it's waiting for some io maybe it's like waiting for a db call or it's waiting for a network call and things like that the next statement is not going to get executed immediately it's going to wait till that particular statement finishes its execution and it, the next statement will execute only after that so this is a typical uh, code flow which you which you would have probably seen in most of the uh, web applications or uh, or any any application which involves network calls right so the problem with this is uh, your execution stack gets stopped at that point and it's waiting for the other uh, for the so basically it's going to wait for the input or the output which is going to happen and generally when you uh, in for any in any computer architecture the input and output is way slower than the execution which is going to happen and uh, so to cope up with this most of the network programs what they do is like they spawn new threads for each of these requests and most almost all of these threads would be blocked on the io at any point at some particular point in time so what's the problem with that so the problem the main problem with that is threads are not uh, you know lightweight on the resource part so if you have to create a new thread or a new process the os has to get involved and it has to create the thread it has to allocate the memory for it and it has to maintain the descriptor for it and all that stuff which takes time and which also takes up lot of resources and also there should be a master thread which should which should maintain all these different threads and things like that and that's where node js is slightly different or node js or any eventer 
system is slightly different there. So what you're going to do is you're going to give a callback to any function which is going to get delayed, right? For even whether it's going to wait for an input or an output, you're just going to give a callback to it and then you continue your execution stack. And whenever that particular input or output returns back, you that the callback gets called. So this is a typical code flow for that. So here the callback function, which is given as a second argument to the function to that to that method call or whatever, would get executed uh, when that I/O returns. And when the when initially the code is getting executed, the statement after this would get executed e would get would get uh, executed uh, immediately. Okay. So, um, so what is the main advantage of this? So the main advantage is that you're not going to get blocked. You're not going to create multiple threads. What you're going to do is you're, got, you're just going to have a function call. So for a function call, you just basically have to create a heap, right? So you don't have to do anything else. The OS doesn't need to create a new thread or doesn't have to spawn a new process and all that. So it's just going to have some heap allocation done and then the, the, the particular code can just like keep executing. So that's one of the main advantage of an event at I.O. And it gets immediate, I mean, the advantage gets uh, really um, imminent if you're going to do a lot of concurrent uh, client request models. So basically where if you have a network program which has a lot of concurrent clients connecting to it, then this, this becomes a real advantage for you because you are not going to get blocked by a single client's request. The main program which is going to Con, which, which is going to receive or which is going to consume all these requests can just like listen for these requests, get it and allocate a callback to it and then can and then can end the execution. And then it can go and then probably like, you know, serve the other clients. So your client queue is not blocked because of input by another process. Okay. So any questions so far or am I going too fast or something? So hope I'm, hope everybody is clear about event IO and why we need event IO and all that stuff. So uh, let's see how a callback works now. Yes. Sorry, can you be a bit loud? Sorry, can you be a bit loud? I'm not able to hear it all. Okay. Yes. 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 So I didn't get the last part. How do you? Okay. So uh, the question is that since the event and model is going to be slightly different than the traditional model, how are you going to do locking? Right? That's the question. So uh, in Node.js, there is no concept of locking. So you don't do any locking here. So the locking comes into picture when there are multiple threads which are going to try to access a single resource. So here that scenario is not going to happen. So what you are doing is like every request which comes in gets a callback assigned to it. So there aren't any uh, concurrent things which are happening. So you don't need you don't necessarily need a lock for it. So did I answer your question? Okay. 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 So, uh, so the question is, uh, if you have two operations which needs to be done, so and these operations have to be done sequentially, and uh, more than sequentially, let's assume that they are dependent on each other. So that second operation is dependent on the first operation. So in that case, what you have to do is, uh, the second operation should start only after the first, right? So you'll have the callback for the first operation. And inside the callback for the first operation, you can start the second operation. You can assign the callback inside that. So that would solve the dependency issue. But generally, you don't do that, but unless and until 
they are like really dependent on each other and there is no point in proceeding with the second option if the first uh, what a first task is not done. So in that case you can put it inside the callback of the first. Uh, so your question is like, do you have to re-architect your program? Yeah. So uh, yes, that. So basically, uh, you have to go get into invented I/O if you want to do things in Node.js. You cannot continue to do it the sequential way you. Okay, so it also depends on what you actually want to do with your program, right? So uh, Node.js is good, but it's not the solution for all the problems. So there are certain types of problems uh, for which eventad IO could be an advantage for you. But there could be other, you know, if it's just a batch job, right, where you just want to execute a sequence, sequence step of jobs, and it has nothing to do with, uh, so in those cases, it may be better you don't go you don't do it in the evented way and then you continue to do it in the typical sequential way which you do so it, it again depends on what problem you are trying to solve so node.js is good but it's not the solution for all problems so there are set of problems for which node.js is good there are set of other problems for which the traditional sequential programming model is good so we may probably have to decide decide that before you uh, take it up so any questions before Okay, so uh, let's see an example of a callback. Um, okay, so so is the text visible or do we want this is good? Okay. <laughs> So this is just a, a, a example for callback, and to just explain the concept that that things don't happen sequentially, right? So uh, what we do is we have a set timeout function. It's most like it's it, you can compare it like a, to a timer, right? Or you can, if you're familiar with Java, then you can compare it with the threads you create in Java, right? And it's okay. It's not technically a thread, but I'm just like giving you a uh, vague exam, vague comparison. And uh, so what happens here is, so you say that after two seconds, so this is like 200 milliseconds, 2000 milliseconds, which is like two seconds. After two seconds, call this function. So this is the function. So this is a function which is going to get called after two seconds, right? And the callback is assigned to it, and then the, the, and then the execution is going to continue with the next statement after that. So when we execute this, uh, you would see that first the second statement is going to get ex executed and then after that the callback after two seconds the callback gets kicked in and then that would get executed so you can see that so first the second statement gets executed and after that after two seconds the callback gets kicked in and then it gets executed so this is the uh, so this is how things happen in node.js right so everything is evented and it's not it's not going to get executed in the order in which it is present. And okay, so let's move on. So that was just a small example for evented I/O. And uh, so, <coughs> so you have decided that you are going to use Node.js. So let me tell you uh, how do you do that. So first you have to install Node.js, uh, then install npm. Npm is nothing but a package manager for Node.js uh, from the Linux world, you could probably compare it with an app get or aptitude or yum or something like that. It's a pa it's a package manager for Node.js, and uh, you can use commands like npm install and then give a module name to install um, any any Node.js modules. Okay, and uh, you can also use Node to Node as an interactive uh, you know an interactive console to to quickly uh, probably not run commands. 
So this is similar to what you do in Python. So in Python, you have an interactive shell with which you can interact. So the same thing can be done with Node.js as well. So uh, uh, after you install Node, so in my in my laptop, I've already installed Node. So what you can do is you can just like give Node, just type Node alone, and then it opens an interactive command for you. Uh, okay, so you can do things like uh, normal assignments. So is it visible or do we? Okay, so you can do things like this, or you can test Boolean expressions, something like true, not equal to false, and uh, you can, I mean, you, ca you can also create functions and then call functions and all that. You can import modules, so you can probably try something like var b is equal to 3 plus 2, and... and stuff like that. So it's more like an interactive uh, console where you can, if you are just getting started with Node, uh, you can just like use this, you can try some of these programs and all that. So it can also be used to uh, as, a, as a calculator or things like that. So you basically you can get a feel of Node by using this uh, interactive, interactive prompt. And uh, so there are like a couple of, couple of commands which you can use to get more information. So one is help. So if you say dot help, it gives you what are the uh, other commands which are available for you. So you get uh, break, you get <coughs> clear, so which is to clear the screen and all that. So there are like a lot of these commands available. So you can like try it out if you're like very new to Node and, and then just wanna get a feel of it. And so the other way to use Node is like creating servers. So Node is very good when you when you are creating network programs, especially server server components. Okay. So let's see how we can create a server component in Node. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just create a HTTP server. Uh, so let me. So this is a code for creating an HTTP server. Uh, which can serve com which can serve content and things like that. So this is a very small, uh, very simple server. So what I'm going to do is every time a client connects to it, I'm just going to <coughs> going to print the word "hello world" to it. Okay. So uh, so this statement here, what we are doing is we are trying to import a module. So this importing a module is similar to uh, what you do in Java, right? You have import statements in Java and maybe in Python and things like that, or hash include in C. So this is similar to that. So uh, you, so this is a, this is the common JS format. And so what you're going to do is, uh, right now I'm going to include the HTTP module into this program. And HTTP has a method called create server, by which I'm going to create a server. So that is going to take a, take a callback. See, this is the callback function here. So this function would get executed every time whenever a client client request is made to the server. Okay. So inside the callback, what I'm doing is just I'm gonna uh, set the content type for the response as a plain text, and then I'm gonna echo hello world to it and then end it. Okay. And then this is gonna listen on port number 1332 on the local host. And this statement would get executed once the callback has been assigned. So when we execute this, uh, you could probably see that this gets executed first. And whenever there is a request to the to the server, the callback gets executed. Okay, so let's try running this. By the way, all these code samples are there in GitHub, so you don't actually have to write them. If write them, uh, I would share the link on my PPT where you can get all these uh, code snippets. So I have started the HTTP server now. So it's running on my uh, local host on port 1332. So let's open this from a browser. And 
you can see that the callback gets executed and then you get hello world as a response back. So uh, again, the main the main concept here is that the state the the statements are not executed in order. So the the callback gets assigned and the callback gets invoked only when that particular event happens, right? So uh, so this is just a very simple HTTP server, but you can probably do a lot of other stuff like you know if you want to serve static content, you can just read it from the disk and then you know flush it to the response or to the response object so that it is served to the uh, it is served to the client who made the request. You can also set the content type. You can uh, live stream it, do whatever you want. So there are like a lot of modules which help you to, which helps you to do that. And uh, so any questions? Yes. Sorry. Okay. So the question is, uh, how how this this particular small server helps when there is when there are going to be concurrent requests, right? So in a in a traditional web app, in a traditional web server, for example, if you take Apache, Nginx is slightly different, but let's assume it's Apache, right? So what this what is going to happen in this scenario? Uh, so let's assume there are uh, ten concurrent requests which come to the server, right? So the Apache server would start creating threads for each of these 10 requests. So uh, what you will end up have, having is you have a main thread and then 10 different threads uh, which are created to serve 10 different clients. So Apache is like slightly more uh, intelligent in that way because it doesn't cr keep creating threads, it tries to reuse threads and all that. Okay, so let's, for the, uh, for the uh, argument, let's assume that it creates thread for every new request, right? So here what's gonna happen is there's gonna be only one thread, there is no, threads which are going to get created at all. So what happens is, when a request comes, it, it gets this callback assigned to it on the same process. It's not that you are having multiple processes created for it. This, the call, it's just that it's, it's like a function call. So when you do a function call, it gets allocated in the heap. right? In your heap, heap memory, you get the uh, return address and all that stuff, and then you get the function call. So the same thing is going to happen here. So it's not going to create multiple threads. It's, a, it's a, just a single process which is executing this. Sorry? It does not maintain actually. It doesn't maintain different sessions. So what is actually, it's, for Node.js, it's just a function call. Just like a callback which gets called up for each of those requests. Yes. Okay. I mean, it creates multiple threads for each request, the Apache server. I mean, that would actually be able to serve the request concurrently better, I guess, rather than a single process node. Node is just a single process, it doesn't branch off. Okay, so it, it again depends on your, it depends on what application you want to do, right? So whether, uh, so for, so the problem with Apache is that when there are like lot of concurrent requests, it ends up creating lot of threads which eats up a lot of resources and then your the load on your server goes up and things like that. But if you want a way by which you want to talk to multiple processes at the same time and things like that, then you might probably have to go with Apache, right? So Node.js has advantage in certain scenarios. It's not, as I said, like, it's not the solution for all problems. So did I answer your question? Yeah, but now I have different questions. Maybe I'll ask you. Okay. Maybe like we can take it off. Then. So, any questions? Yes. 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 No. Okay. Go ahead with your question, and I'll answer that. Okay, so uh, to answer your question, the thread, so uh, one process taking time 
or one particular request taking time is not going to affect the other processes. Not the other process, Sorry, not, not the other request. So because what's going to happen is every request which comes in is going to have its own callback. It may be I.O., it may not Okay. So, uh, see, the blocking, so there are, there are two things, two places where it, get, where it can get blocked, right? One is, you're doing some huge number crunching, where at that particular point, it's the CPU which gets blocked. You get blocked at CPU level. There are other places where uh, you get blocked at the I.O. level. You get blocked because you have made a DB query or you made a network request or you are reading from a local file. So in that case, the CPU is not getting blocked, it's just the I.O. which is getting blocked. And because of the I.O., CPU is idle, right? In the first scenario where the CPU, is, CPU, CPU itself is getting blocked, in that case, Node.js is not going to help you. Node.js would help you if your CPU is idle, but the process gets blocked because of some I.O. which is happening. So the second case where it's getting blocked by IO, uh, so Node.js would be. Node would really help and it's perfect. But what about the first case where I have some uh, case where I do need to use a number crunching? Okay. Uh, so should I abandon Node at this point or? So uh, again, it depends on your application. If predominantly you're going to do only number crunching and you're going to do very, very small amount of IO and your bottleneck is not IO, it's just the number crunching part or the CPU part. Then, you, then it's not recommended for you to go with Node.js. No you can probably go with your... So how do I do anything in the background if I have to? What I know so far is it has to be native code, I just know. No, uh, you, can sp sp you can spawn child processes in Node.js. Uh, I have code for that a little later. So you can spawn child, child processes and then you know uh, do it. Uh, but that's not the general way or the more efficient way to use Node.js. But you can still uh, create child processes. Yes. Sorry, once you spawn child processes? Yes. Yeah, so that's why I said it, Node.js is not going to give you any advantage in those scenarios. Where Node.js would, would really help. Uh, let's assume a case where you have to serve a lot of static content or you have to serve big files. So what happens in Apache is you get, Apache is going to create a lot of threads for you and so that would probably consume more resources on your uh, server and your server load would go up and your server's capacity to serve the number of clients would go down. But if you're going to use Node.js for that scenario, with the same server, with the same resources, you would be able to serve more clients. So, because each request is a function your Yes. So, it's, the OS is not going to get kicked in and the OS is not going to create multiple threads, which in turn is not going to consume more resources. But yeah. So, for each function, there has to be some memory which is asked to be reserved. That's what I said. The heap memory has to be allocated for it. But when you compare it with the with the with the amount of resources that needed for creating new thread, this is slightly less. So you get an advantage there. So it's not that Node.js is like so. so the is the yeah, that can also fill up. So relatively, if if Apache is like able to handle a thousand clients. Node.js might probably be able to handle 2,000 clients or maybe 3,000. But eventually Node.js is also going to make a, you know, it's, gonna, it's also going to run out of memory. But the amount, the number of clients, relatively speaking, the number of clients you can access or number of clients you can serve with the same resource is slightly higher. Uh, there are benchmarks, I can share it with you offline maybe. Yes. In Node.js, it's a non-blocking call. So you get a call back for that. Okay, I have some code samples for that. I can show you how, it, how it's getting done. Yes. So, follow uh, question to what So, uh, let's say there's only one process of Node.js running, mm -hmm. in which uh, the incoming request, irrespective of whether it's a I/O intensive or CPU intensive, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually blocking the second request, right? 
unless you actually create the subprocess which you talked about. Uh, it's not actually going to stop it, right? So what happens is, so there is a queue, there's a client queue which is there. Correct. So there are like multiple requests from clients which are coming. So there is a queue and this queue is, is getting handled by the event loop. Correct. So a, every time a, a, a client request comes in from the queue, what this is going to do is it's either, so in, in Apache is just going to create processes for each of those Correct. requests. Correct. Not just, it's just going to do a callback for each of those processes. Correct. It'll do a callback for each one of them. Yes. But since it is only one single thread, right? When mm -hmm. the callback is being executed, which is actually, let's say, I want to execute, let's say, all three queues themselves. Okay. That thread is blocked, right? Which means you don't have another thread available to serve those next, next request, right? Even if it is an event callback. Uh, it's not. People are getting messages I like the heavy threads of Apache and the lightweight threads within the node JS. A callback can be considered as a lightweight thread. Yeah, so the only difference is that the it's node not. JS handles the threading, and it's not the operating system. Yes. Okay. So maybe you can just explain how the actual callback thing works. Maybe it's out of the scope for this class. Just okay. So that's why I was like, you know, slightly asking whether people have an understanding about evented I/O and all that. So the callback function. So uh, you know, the main difference is that, you know, if you take a threaded example and a callback, right? So in in if you're going to use threads, the OS gets kicked in. So the OS has to create a new process, has to new has to spawn a new process. It has to <coughs> it has to allocate its own program memory and all that stuff, and then it also have to allocate its own heap and all that. So which is uh, slightly more resource intensive operation, which has to be done. But in case of a callback, the OA, it's not going to go to the OS level at all. It's been maintained by the process. Uh, I mean the process which is running Node.js Node.js itself. So from the OS perspective, there are not going to be any more threads which are going to get created. So. Uh, so I think so the, this word I keep is like we will move forward. Okay. But like uh, at some point of time, if you just attach a debug and show this is what's happening when a request comes in. Okay. I think that's, I, I don't know. So yeah. Okay, so let's probably do that then. This kind of solution, the same example, we could uh, maybe make this particular call sleep for some time, then make a concurrent call and see if you know. The concurrent so call. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a. Uh, Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's take it offline. Let's see the other examples which I have. Okay. So this is moving. On. <laughs> so moving on. So this is like how we uh, how we will be using Node.js as a client. Okay. So let me quickly show you the example here. So here, what I'm doing, what I'm basically trying to do is I'm uh, including the same HTTP module. And I'm creating a request object. So for the request object, I have to specify the host, port, path, method, and all that stuff. The typical things which you have to do for creating a HTTP request. And then uh, I'm assigning a callback again here. So what's going to happen is whenever there's a response which comes back, this callback gets called in. And then it's going to, uh, so from the response object, I can get the response status code. And again, in order to even get the data from it, or I have to, I have to use another callback. So this uh, this probably explains the dependency scenario which we talked about, right? So first, in order to get data from a request object, you need you need the request object first. So the first callback is doing that. So you are getting a request object first, sorry, a response object first, and from the response object, you're gonna you're gonna assign another callback when the data is available. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I think this should fire it, or maybe like I probably missed it. I don't. Know. I'll check that out. I think the request on would fire it up. So when you assign a callback, I think it also fires the request request as part of it. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to run this example because I don't have connectivity to the internet right now. Um, so let's. Sorry. Okay.
then let's So the server is running here and Okay, I think let's move on um, because like I have a lot of other examples to cover and we have very little time. So, uh, <clears throat> so these are some of the code modules which are available as part of Node.js. You have the processes for handling client processes and things like that. You have the file system module. You have the networking module which has like a lot of uh, classes or modules, sub modules using which you can create a TCP connection or a HTTP connection and DNS, you can do DNS and all, all that stuff. And then you have the utilities module, which also has like a lot of uh, functions which can make use of in your Node.js. So this link here, uh, you can follow this link to find out what are the <coughs> entire list of modules which are available in uh, Node.js. So I think there are close to some 30 modules which are available. Uh, these are part of the core. And for if you need more modules, then you can use any of the other uh, extensions which are available to you. So these are built-in modules. These are not third-party modules. Okay. So the philosophy of Node is that the core uh, part of the library would be, or the core part of the framework is very light. And if you want to have any extensions or if you want to have additional functionalities, that is available as an extension to you. And you can find those extensions and then install it using npm. So uh, so let's see some examples for the process module. So so somebody asked me about creating child processes, right? So let's see how we can do that. So so <coughs> So this is a code sample which shows you how you can create child processes. Uh, Node.js is not going to be very efficient in doing this, but suppose in case if you have to create child processes, you can do this. So there is a child process module which you have to uh, import, and then there is a spawn uh, module, submodule inside that. So that is going to, using that you would be uh, creating a child process. So here what I'm doing is I'm just like uh, using grep. So the first first argument is a command which needs to be executed, and the second is a list of arguments which you have to uh, send to it. So I'm just like uh, creating a new uh, new process which is going to execute grep. Okay, and uh, sorry. Yes. So let's quickly see. Three minutes more. Okay. Okay, so it has spawned a new thread and this is the child process ID. Uh, okay, so there are other uh, modules like file system. Let me see if I can just like show you the source code for the file system modules. Uh, so this basically shows you how you can read files. So this is like, so this, is, this particular uh, function, the stat function is gonna give you more information about a file. So you can find out what is the, size of it or what is what are what is the date in which created last modified date and all these meta information which are associated with the file and this is going to tell you how you can read file from the local system local file system and and as you can see all of these have callbacks okay so let's quickly so you can see so 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 it was it just like went ahead and then i'm just like dumping the entire object here so you get all the information about that particular file, the date in which created, modified time, and all that size, 
what is the UID, GID, and all that stuff. Okay. And so you can also check the uh, check the other files which are there in my GitHub. You, you have a lot of these examples to try out different modules. Um, so this is a networking module. So you ha you have the HTTP request, HTTPS modules, DNS modules, and all that. Uh, you can also make HTTPS calls, the secure calls. I'm not going to run these examples now. Uh, again, you have these utility uh, module where you have. So I've been using console. So console is part of the utility module uh, that is basically used to output something to the uh, standard output. Uh, to the standard output which is available. You also have utils. So let me see if I can quickly show you the code. What about the database access? Uh, database access you might probably have to use third party modules. It depends on which database you want to access, whether you want to access MongoDB or CouchDB or MySQL or whatever. So there are like third party extensions available and then you just like you install them using NPM and then you can start using that. Sorry? Uh, I don't think there are any native things for database. Uh, So as I said, the core part of Node wants to be as simple as possible, so that you can extend it, and then there are like third-party things which are available where you can use it. Time's up. Okay. Okay. So just one more minute. So, so as I said, Node.js is useful for certain applications. Uh, maybe like these are some examples of applications, but again, before you even you start, you might probably have to. Uh, figure out whether it's like really useful and things like that. And these are some of the terminologies. NPM is the package manager, and modules is like the plugin or add-on for it. Then there are like a couple of other modules or frameworks which are available. We have Express, uh, Jade, Socket IO. I think Aditya is going to talk about Socket IO a little later. And then there's also a talk about Express where which shows you how you can create MEZ applications and all that. So, <laughs> so these are the links. Thank you.